Good morning. My name is Bill Chamberlain, and I lead the global sales and marketing teams here at Verix. For those of you that are new to Verix, we're a leader in providing audiovisual solutions for the modern workplace. For over 70 years, in, in fact, next year we'll be celebrating our 75th anniversary. During that time, we've been helping organizations leverage their ever-changing business communication needs to solve problems and to grow. With our global presence, Verix is proud to help organizations leverage these solutions to meet an entirely new set of business challenges and implement enhanced user experiences. I wanna thank all of our attendees for joining us in today's webinar. This is the second in a webinar in a three-part series that continues us on a journey through the hybrid workplace. As a large number of businesses continue to move forward with reopening their offices, Verix has created this series and assembled a team of knowledge experts to educate us and discuss these solutions. These experts included people from our own team here at Verix, today from our manufacturing partners, and finally next month from representatives of the businesses themselves. Today, our manufacturing partners from Aver, Crestron, and Sure will be focusing on enabling greater collaboration. First, I'd like to introduce Jeff Stachura with Crestron. Jeff has been in the voice data and collaboration space for nearly 20 years focusing on UC and collaboration solutions for enterprise customers with a specialty focus on Microsoft Teams and Zoom in the modern workplace. Welcome, Jeff. Glad you could join us today. Good morning, Bill. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Next, I'd like to introduce Vanessa Jensen from Sure. Vanessa is an avid technology enthusiast with over 15 years experience in the professional audio and integrated systems market. She has successfully managed product lines ranging from loudspeakers to discussion systems, infrared listening and RF analog digital wireless. Vanessa has designed and supported a variety of high profile installations in educational facilities, corporate boardrooms, houses of worship, theaters, and even more. Welcome Vanessa. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. For our third panelist, let's welcome Carl Harbell from Aver. Carl works with business, uh, customers as business partners through technical adoption, downtime mitigation, and consultation to create lifetime loyalty. With over 20 years of experience in the video conferencing industry, he always has a focus on enhancing process and technology to automate and simplify business needs and delight customers. Morning, Carl. Morning. Thanks for having me. And last, I would like to welcome Ben Dandola Grubb, our Vice President of Engineering Services. Ben continues to not only drive best practice solutions, but more importantly, help us all understand the dynamic technology plays in implementing successful business solutions. This three-part series was developed by Ben as a way to educate both our partners and our clients. Thank you, Ben. Good morning. Thanks, Bill. Before we start, I want to cover a few quick administrative details. First, we are recording today's session and we'll make the replay available following. You'll be able to find this recording as well as our previous webinars, technology solutions, and general tips and tricks videos on our Verix YouTube channel. Please subscribe to be notified as we continue to release new content. Additionally, we will be having a Q&A period at the end of the webinar. Please be sure to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and type in any questions. And now I'll turn it over to our expert team. Ben, it's all yours. All right, thank you very much, Bill. Let's get started here. All right, to kick us off, I wanna welcome our manufacturers for the ultimate manufacturer throwdown. So today we are going to have a competition of fourth grade multiplication tables. Oh wait, Bill says I'm doing the wrong thing here. All right, back to hybrid workplace. We're gonna be talking about collaboration, what it means to Microsoft, about using Microsoft Teams and Zoom, having great audio, great video, how to wrap it all together and add some control features on the compute device of your choice. So hybrid workplace. Um, Carl, if I start kicking it off here with you, we've all spent mm -hmm. a lot of time working from home over the past 12, 15 months. What kind of challenges have either you personally seen or heard about from others out there? Well, working from home, uh, especially when it was mandated last year, uh, I would say the biggest, um, challenge that I had was being dynamic. And when I mean by being dynamic, all of a sudden I wasn't in a, in a home situation where I had three other kids doing video calls for school. And so I thought that I was going to have, you know, all the bandwidth I needed. I thought I was going to have that one spot where it looked really nice in the living room. Um, no, I got booted out. I pretty much, you know, was either on video calls a half an hour after they started, um, they took all the cameras, 
they pretty much took all the resources from me. They left me uh, alone. So, <laughs> but with that in mind, I think a lot of people had to, uh, they had to adapt. They had to learn, you know, different spots to uh, take calls, you know, set up new offices in their home. Um, for instance, I am right now in a closet. <laughs> um, I had to make a huddle room. <laughs> I'm like, hey, that master closet looks like a huddle room. Um, but generally, that's what uh, I think a lot of people had to do and it had to be very dynamic. Now, um, as people are going back into the office, I think they're still going to work from home, but they are going to be a little bit more fluid in how they actually do it. You know, taking calls from the backyard, taking calls from the couch. Um, I could definitely see a lot of people doing that more often. And I've seen and heard lots of different stories. There's people who absolutely love working from home and they found that they are the most productive there. And there's others of us who have major challenges working from home. Vanessa, I think you're different in the sense that I believe you were primarily have been working from home all through this. So did this really make any change for you? I mean, it did make a little bit of a change for me in that, you know, I wasn't just conversing with colleagues. So, you know, I thought it was important to get a proper camera. I thought it was important to get a proper, you know, microphone and this background behind me, which allowed me to have the best audio quality and the best video quality that I could for these calls. But similar to what Carl said, I mean, I saw a lot of lack of consistency, you know, bandwidth issues. I had some colleagues that were going robotic often, which was quite amusing initially, but then it just, you know, just got to be quite too much. So I think um, in my particular situation, um, you know, kind of upping my at home conferencing game so that I could interact on these types of panels with, with clients and customers um, was certainly something that I found myself doing just like I think everybody else out there, right? There was really hard to get a USB device, a USB camera, USB type microphone. I mean, they were back ordered for a very long time. Um, but I found that, you know, these types of things can make, you know, your experience at home that much better. I think we've definitively seen that that market is not going to slow down and for either personal devices for your home or your corporate office, but also the larger offices. Yesterday I was meeting with a distributor and they sh were showing me some of their back orders and it, there's not, it's just because there's a demand, they're like 20,000 unit on one back order on one of these small personal webcams. It's just impressive to see that there is that demand and it's absolutely across the board. How about you, Jeff? I think you've heard some interesting stories. Do you work from home or the office most of the time? So I, I work remotely. So I work, I've been working from home for about 15 years. Um, so that part of it was not a big impact, but what was is not able, not being able to travel and see my customers and do walkthroughs of their spaces and have that, you know, face-to-face -face relationship. Um, so that was a really big impact and having to do all of our business remotely. That being said, we had a really incredible year last year. I did, you know, one of my best years professionally um, because we were able to leverage these tools and enable better audio, better video. And, um, you know, we're all forced into very, and, and I probably none of us on this call, but a lot of our customers and uh, their teams were forced into learning these collaboration platforms and how to not even just survive, but thrive and leverage all the goodness that you can get out of working remotely um, and, and using tools like this. Yeah. That all sounds just like my experience here from talking and, and speaking with many different people, both clients and just friends and family here as well. So now we're at the stage where the whole country is planning to bring, well, different manufacturers are saying you're going to work from home forever you know, not manufacturer, but different corporations. And some are planning to bring people back to the office. I wanted to gauge what experience or feedback from you. Jeff, why don't we start with you? What in general have you been heard about different large corporations in their planning for bringing them back to the office? So I, I feel like over the last year, year and a half, um, obviously as things were closed, it was a great opportunity for us to work and, and our, we ramped up, we never slowed down. We got busier and did more product evaluations and had more vetting sessions and, you know, road mapping and discussing what's coming. Um, and I feel like everyone was waiting for the vaccine to come out and for it to be a little bit safer. So, so now we're in that spot and every large global organization that I'm working with is crafting or executing their return to work strategy. Um, and the strategies really vary, but um, what, you know, enabling 
users with technology across the board, whether that technology is going to be used in a home office to perfect that experience. You know, someone is now, I mean, our company is, you know, we're a company like any other, and we have graded people. So I am, I am personally full remote. We have some that are hybrid. They're to be in the office maybe twice a week, and then some that are in five days a week. Um, so the, the need for enterprise grade solutions that can support workers across the board, home office, um, hot desking or boardroom, you know, and we're seeing all of those being executed and deployed as quickly as possible. Yep. How about a, how about a, a pointed question here? Um, Carl, can working from a traditional office be better than working from home? Oh, definitely. I mean, one of the big things that you have to consider with offices is, you know, uh, consistent lighting, really. That's, that's one of the big things that I've noticed. Um, going to a conference room, knowing sure it's well lit. Like I said, being uh, before working from home, it's dynamic. And so you're working in the living room, sun's coming down or going up. Um, your light's not going to be the same from when you thought it was going to be. And so that's why we started making like light embedded with cameras and some of the new product lines that we have to kind of work with that dynamic feature. Now, if you're going to be working from the office, like what Jeff was saying, hot desking could be a big thing as well, as far as, you know, people won't have a consistent place to go to. And so they might be, they might have to uh, be adaptive a little bit, but not as much compared to being at the home office. So if you want consistency, most likely office layouts are going to be the same. Conference rooms are going to be the same. The muscle memory is going to be there. But, you know, working from home, I mean, you can't pass up just being able to go to the living room, take a little relaxer, and then go back to the office. So it's kind of nice, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you go out and mow the lawn in the middle of the workday. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I never do that, by the way. I only okay. all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Vanessa, what about you? I believe you're going to be continuing to work from home primarily, but maybe now you can get out and see people and do things. That's something I've been missing. Yeah, me as well. I think I'm really looking forward to getting back out there. Um, you know, we are hearing that people are saying to their employees, come back. You know, there is a bit of flexibility in terms of what I'm hearing, you know. Um, some people are saying we want everybody back all the time. And that's, you know, a small subset. There's also people that are saying, you know, you can stay remote. Um, but there's more of this kind of hybrid, fluid, dynamic situation that I'm seeing out there. And I think, um, as Jeff was mentioning, it's a great opportunity to really get consistent um, video conferencing experience for all of your, um, you know, all of your workers. It's, it's very important that regardless of where you're located, you're able to collaborate and communicate with your colleagues, um, you know, really regardless of your location, re regardless if you're in the backyard with your lawnmower in hand. I mean, it, it really, um, it really is pointing to, I think, the need for us to kind of relook at, you know, what we have in those spaces and what we're using for communication, collaboration. I mean, soft codecs, there was a huge boom in adoption of soft codecs last year, like MS Teams and Zoom. I think they had like a three fold increase in paying customers last year as composed to, as opposed to 2019. So, you know, those systems are out there now. Now we need to go back and make sure that we've got all of the right, you know, audio and video components and, and um, control components to interface with them and make that experience, you know, so it can be as productive as possible, as effective as possible. I fully believe that it's our collective responsibility to show how much better the experience can be in the office, in the corporate office, than working from home, because that's what enables people to truly collaborate with one another in person and also participating with those remote and hybrid people. So let's get into some of the details here of, of what this means. How do we make this possible because we all bring different aspects to the table that work together in critical and in nice ways. Um, so let's talk about expectations. You're going into the office. What is a different expectation today? And Jeff, let's start with you. What's an expectation that an average user might have when they go to the office compared to a year, two years ago? 
So I think we can all acknowledge there's been a big shift in expectation, in experience, and in screen share when we're doing calls like this. So um, you know we're all we're all remote somewhere at this you know today, um, and we all have our own screen. We have our own experience that we can manage. So this is you know I'm in total control of what I'm broadcasting um, and what I'm getting back. I can push content. I cannot. I can mute myself and get up and walk away. When I get into a conference room, I will lose a lot of that that personalized experience. So now I'm one of many, and the shift has turned. So you know, working remote, you were the third class citizen. Now I'm in charge. So I'm I'm first class. Look, I have this whole box to myself. I'm not sharing it with anyone. Um, so I think the expectation is how do we replicate that through hardware and software solutions to give everyone that customized individual experience. Um, and our platform partners, Zoom and Teams, um, are doing some of that with camera technology that we support and our and uh, Aver supports. So um, we can pull out individual streams and then put them up as Hollywood squares. So we can replicate some of that individual experience. You know, one of the other things that's you know. I, I can reach out to a resource without being seen and look like I'm a subject matter expert and everything. Um, when I'm in a conference room, I'm more exposed. So we're, we're going to get back to that. You know, we gain a whole lot of in-person, collaborative, nonverbal feedback that we really don't have the opportunity to get over video. Um, but we lose a little bit of personalized experience. I think we are working towards an area where if I'm the average user walking into a meeting space, it's almost as if I can have my cake and eat it too, if everything's done properly. And what I mean is that you can build a Zoom room, a Teams room, but then overlay that BYOD if, if it's desired. And, and to me, that's a, a corporate workflow. It's a decision that's made on the front end. Are you gonna say you are Zoom only, a Zoom room only? And, and take it or leave it? Or are you going to say, well, you have the option, bring your own laptop in, fine. You can have your own world there <laughs> in front of you as well. Um, but let's go down that, what I think of as equity path for a minute here. So I think of it as video conferencing equity. Carl, as a camera manufacturer, um, are there ways or solutions that you see there today or coming in the future that allow us, let's just say you're seated on one side of the conference room, I'm on the other. Solutions there? Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where, I mean, I think you can see some promo videos right now from some uh, service providers out there that are starting to do that like smart gallery type of uh, viewing to where you crop out all of the unnecessary um, uh, unnecessary portions of the video and only show the, uh, the people that are in the video. Now, there's a couple of different ways you could do that. You could do it from the service provider side. You could do it from the, uh, from the endpoint side. Uh, I think a lot of the... Uh, service providers out there right now kind of want it to be done from the camera side, um, only to alleviate the processing power of, mm. you know, all the Amazon web services that they may be using. So it's uh, something that I know we've been looking at, uh, and other camera manufacturers have been as well. Uh, those are the types of things that are, I think, going to make people more confident to use video. Because, you know, as it is right now, somebody walks into a conference room by themselves. Uh, if it was up to them to frame it up, there'll be a little tiny image, <laughs> a little tiny thumbnail in a big image. Um, with, uh, but, you know, if, if they're cropped, if the image looks good, is, if the image is, uh, I don't want to say doctored up or filtered, but if it comes in crisp, uh, I think a lot of people will be more confident to use video. And not think that, you know, oh, I look too ghostly. I don't look good. I look like I'm, you know, having ate food and drank water for a long time. So, um, you know, that's the types of the things where I think it'll help adoption with video um, from the camera side. I would certainly make the argument that people have been accustomed to become being on camera over the past year in all sorts of scenarios where you probably look, in many cases, really terrible on camera with your lighting <laughs> and maybe the camera that you had. So... On average, you walk into a conference space in an office, you're going to look better on camera oh, yeah. than you did sitting in the corner of your garage when that was the only space. That you oh, had. absolutely. Do, do you guys remember when um, when uh, the news started doing their segments like from home and everybody was using their webcams and there were just terrible angles, terrible lighting? You could tell they got a lot better at it throughout the months. <laughs> 
it's easy to forget the lighting, but that is, as you said before, Carl, one of the most important aspects we have there. All right, so let's move on here, talking about how do you get your meeting started? So I'm sure that we've all been in a conference room where you walk in and no one can figure out how to use the technology. And then maybe eight or 10 minutes later, your, your call is fully up and running. Part of what we need to bring to the table is consistency and ease of use. Uh, Jeff, what are your thoughts there? What's the best way to start a meeting quickly? So, and you're so right. Um, a, a lot of our global accounts and customers were struggling with supporting multiple platforms. You know, we like Teams, we have some WebEx, we have some Zoom, some BlueJeans, some Chime. We have to keep Chime because the finance people like it, or we, you know, and so that's how organizations have been existing and, and um, suffering. And then we we're thrust into COVID and organizations really had to pick and choose what they supported. So they really streamlined down to a couple of platforms. Um, and we support Teams natively and Zoom natively. And that gives a user, and usually we're not talking or about people like us on this call, but we're talking about, you know, an average non-power collaborative user who has to walk into a space and they have to be comfortable with what they're approaching and it has to make sense and kind of be bulletproof and so walking in and seeing that your two o'clock meeting that button is illuminated and you just with one single keystroke you can start a meeting you know um that's that's the easiest thing is to standardize on one maybe two platforms so that your rooms are click to join like one button push scheduled meetings couldn't be easier that's not always the case and not always available for every customer. So we also support a BYOD feature that's available across the board in all our solutions, but that lets you take on those uh, exceptions. Um, I need to meet with a vendor and you know it, they, their platform is BlueJeans and I have to meet them on BlueJeans. Um, so I can walk into a room and without any configuration, no button pushing, no, drivers or anything like that. You can just plug in your laptop and then you can run your, your meeting. I think that's going to be really critical moving forward because yes, most organizations have standardized on you know one or two platforms, but we've also become deeply engaged with our personal devices. You know, this laptop has been in front of me every single day for the last year and a half. And so now I have a comfort level with it. And I can knowing that I can walk into a room and just plug it in just plug it in and then have that meeting, an enterprise grade meeting using that amazing conference room that's been built out. I think that's a total game changer. And that allows people to, you know, merge back into the office with a degree of confidence. You know, you're going to look good and you know, you're going to sound good when you walk into that room. <laughs> And you, and you know that you're not going to be confused about how to use the technology. And that's the biggest thing. You know, I, I say this in a lot of my meetings, we're not designing and building for us. We're designing and building for people that need to go into spaces and they need to present. That can be pretty daunting, just speaking in front of people. Now I have to figure out what button to push or what cable to pull. That should be super, super easy. It should, it should be second sense to just come in and launch a meeting. The design and the solutions that we put forth are 50% for that person in the room, but the other 50% is for the people who are not in that room because you need to be able to see and to hear in order to collaborate with one another. And we haven't really touched too much on audio yet. So let's jump there for a little bit. Vanessa, when it comes to microphones and audio, how do we equate the importance of audio to the rest of the equation here? I'm so glad you asked this question. Um, you know, in my opinion, in all like professional ties aside, I feel that audio is the most important component of a meeting. Um, I feel that video is a nice to have. Of course, it's very nice to see you today, Ben. Um, but Thank if you. I could hear you and, you know, I couldn't see you, I could still continue on with this meeting. I couldn't read your body cues or your body language and understand how you're kind of reacting to what I'm saying, but I would still be able to kind of, we could still have a meeting, right? We could still get something done. Um, as one of my colleagues says, um, video without audio, it's just fancy surveillance in a conference room. Um, I think it's really important to note and kind of even take it a step further that I think high quality audio is a must have something that's intelligible and clear. Um, if you are in an hour long meeting and there is poor audio, you know, you're struggling to hear somebody that's really frustrating. It's 
frustrating for me. I'm assuming it's frustrating for most people out there. And it really does, I think, degrade productivity. So I think it's important that, um, you know, yeah, we have high quality audio. We also have video there. Um, you know, we've got this kind of immersive experience so that we can all focus on what's being said. We can work on, you know, the, the task at hand. We're effective. We're able to really get things done, I think. Um, so I think audio very important. Um, video is also important, I agree, um, to a lesser degree, perhaps. In my mind, the best audio system is one you don't notice, unfortunately. One, yeah, one you can't see or one you can't tell is there, absolutely. Yeah, because I have. we've probably all had the experience where you come out of a meeting, whether it's in person or remotely like this, and you just have a fatigue. And it was really because somebody's audio was poor and you had to exert so much concentration on just listening. And now you're just tired or you maybe even have a headache. Sorry. Absolutely happens. <laughs> um, but let's talk about audio solutions. I'm, I'm going to dive in here a little bit further because I'm, I'm excited about this part here. Um, microphones. Do I have to see them? Can they no. be hidden? <laughs> yeah, they can be totally hidden. Um, you don't even have to touch them in some cases. So they can be in the ceiling, they can be on the wall. Um, if you want a table microphone, of course, that's an option as well. A lot of that um, is dictated by the user, right? How they want to kind of interface with that equipment in that particular conference space. But regardless really of where the microphone is located, you know, you can have a really high quality experience, you know, on a, a hardware-based codec, a software-based codec, on your room system, you know, it can support anything essentially these days. We've got the ability to really be compatible with everything out there. Um, it's important to keep in mind, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, what kind of microphone should I use? What's that size of the room? Is it, you know, super big lecture hall? Then yeah, you're probably going to need multiple microphones. Is it a space that might incorporate some presentation? Um, you can use, you know, these sort of invisible arrays that are in the ceiling, for example, to, you know, aim lobes to capture those individuals without them even knowing it. So they're just basically presenting and they don't have to think about the technology. And I think that's the most exciting thing for me is that, you know, we're giving our, our users, um, you know, a way to just kind of present and be themselves without actually having to, again, think about that particular piece of technology in the puzzle. The more burden that we can remove from the user, the better the experience, the more consistency and the more seamless it's going to be, which enables us to get our actual work done. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely is right. Um, so as we move along here, I want to come back to cameras for a couple minutes here. We were talking about, and, and this was Jeff talking about it, how you're in control of your own experience from your work from home. Uh, you can see me pretty well because I'm the only person in my box. I don't have 12 people circled around a conference room. Um, but Carl, I wanted to dig into the difference between a traditional pan tilt zoom camera experience and either framing or tracking would you mind diving into those and kind of educate us a little bit? Sure, sure. I mean, when you look at the cameras nowadays um, compared to, uh, let's say, in the early 2000s, um, you know, a lot of the optics are, uh, I mean, almost the same. Uh, there has been big enhancements, though, in what we do with the image. And with the, uh, the new SOC chips that are out, the system on the chips that actually do the computations to figure out, okay, is that a person? Is that an object? Is, um, uh, you know, how many people are in the room? Uh, from there, then you could, you know, figure out, okay, well, where's the location of that person? And now that we already have that data, let's frame them up. Huge difference on being able to do that from a system standpoint, because as everybody was saying earlier, when they walk into a conference room, the probably biggest thing on their mind is the agenda, you know, what they're going to do and run the meeting. They shouldn't have to think about framing up the camera. And like I said before, when they walk into the conference room, usually they probably don't even turn on the lights. They're probably automatic lights. They probably don't frame up the, uh, the image. And what you get is a dimly lit room with a very small image of the person in a more of an image of a room. So when you look at automatic framing cameras, and auto tracking cameras, you know, it will recognize a person. It could do that from a variety of different ways. It could do it by body detection, facial detection. But what you're doing is you're creating a consistency for the far end user. And that way, when it does frame up correctly, uh, meetings will just be more successful. There'll be a wider adoption of meetings. You wouldn't have 
uh, five minutes of fiddling around with a control panel, or you wouldn't have, uh, you know, 10 minutes of, well, let's try to recall this preset and, you know, get uh, Becky on the whiteboard over there. If you were to set up a camera, like let's just take our new Cam 20 Pro 2 that we just came out with, you know, we set up different modes in that camera. So you could have uh, a manual framing mode to where you could, you know, press a button on a remote control, you know, count people, frame them up and you'll be done. Or you could have an automatic mode to when you start a meeting, it will look at people's faces, frame it up. If somebody leaves, it'll come out, zoom out again, reframe it, then, you know, kind of, uh, uh, do the computation again. Uh, but then there's a tracking mechanism with it as well. So if somebody walks into an area and you have a preset set there and say, okay, if somebody walks into the area by the whiteboard, instead of framing just them up, it'll frame up that person and the whiteboard as well. So those are the types of features with, or what they say, AI features with cameras that really do make a conference just a lot smoother and really does help out. So are there ways, and this may be targeted at Vanessa, to correlate these two things together between the cameras having the smarts built in, but maybe also incorporating the audio. So now if microphone over there, hears somebody talking, can that also trigger a camera? Vanessa, are there other ways that we've been doing this? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. And we've seen a huge uptick in these types of requests from the market. Um, you know, we can use our array microphones, our MXA 910 can actually send a command string to activate a camera preset based on, you know, which lobe is picking up a particular talker in their seat. So there is ways that we already have information available that we can provide to control systems, to whatnot that can actually take that intelligence and then send that camera to that, that location where Ben is talking, for example, in this larger type conference room. So this is something that um, we're seeing more and more, and it's definitely born out of that um, video conferencing equity topic that we talked about earlier. So, And as artificial intelligence grows, what's exciting to me is that this becomes simpler because when we first, well, I guess I should say, when I first tried this sort of concept 10 years ago, it was tough in the sense that you, you figure out where the camera is going to go you have XYZ coordinates for that camera. And sorry if I'm going too far into details here. And you recall that based on a microphone logo opening. Okay, that's great. Now somebody comes into the room and bumps the camera the teeniest bit. Now that location for XYZ coordinates is never going to work again. <laughs> Not the way to handle it. But with active intelligence, it's how allowing these devices to communicate directly with one another, probably with a crestron processor in the middle. We have so much power here at our fingertips for a great experience. Absolutely. So let's. So Vanessa, talk... I'm going to send you some API code, and we should. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> we should get something going there. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeff, I wanted to come back because we were talking about starting meetings and the one touch to join. To me, I I I roll that into a nutshell of calendar integration. But one of the crazy stories that I heard that I was on a call with a, with a client, and they said that we will never have calendar integration because it's too complicated. And it's never going to be able to integrate with our catering system. It's like, really? That's your holding back? You can't order lunch, so you can't have a one-touch button join experience? Have you ever heard any stories along those lines from your meetings with clients? Um, have I heard the stories? You bet I have. Yeah, plenty of them. Right, guys? Yeah. Um, I think that you know, there's a, there's a lot of asks and there's a lot of wants, and then what translates into actual production is often a very different thing. So, like, yeah, that catering speed bump has been brought up occasionally, but um, you know, you between the three of us in our organizations, we can craft and design to accomplish really any workflow that someone's looking for. So it can be really simple, uncomplicated, and maybe more robust if you just have a direct connect with Exchange. Um, or, you know, whatever your, your scheduling platform is, um, super easy. You know, you just reserve it just like you've done in Outlook for the last 20 some odd years. And then now you're reserving a room. Um, you can also go to the extreme other end of that spectrum and leverage something like a Teams panel um, that supports, uh, it, it supports the whole Teams 
um, experience. It sits outside of a room that's equipped with an MTR. There's no additional licensing and Microsoft has a huge bag full of tricks of what they're going to bring into the, that Teams panel. And it will incorporate both things like very easy scheduling as well as catering and everything in between. Um, so sometimes it just comes down to how much how much pre-work goes into the solution at hand, you know, but, but a lot of it, a lot of it is very, very easy to execute. And Jeff, do you have any recommendations for maybe simple automations that can further reduce or simplify the user experience? You walk yeah. into a room, what happens? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we, we have a current partnership with Aver and we, we bring some of their cameras into our room kits. Um, and one of the things that's an automated feature that's amazing is not only the ability to use that camera as a sensor, a population sensor to see how many people are in a room, but also to use that as a data point overlaid against the, net, the, the restricted population level. So as we're coming back to work, um, and this room is, you know, it was a 12 person room, now it's only a three person room, using camera technology that Aver supplies, um, we can see there's four people in a three person room and we need to proactively send a message out to someone to alert them that, hey, they're not doing social distancing. Um, many of our uh, UC kits and scheduling panels have proximity sensors built in. And that opens up a huge world of opportunity. So as I approach a room, I don't even have to go into the room, but as I approach the room, just by sensing me, that can trigger a series of automated events. So we assume that you're going to be collaborating. So we're gonna lower the, the, the light filtering blinds, um, maybe adjust the HVAC to 71 degrees, um, maybe trigger a light that shows that the room is occupied. Um, and, and you name it, like the list goes on and on of what we can integrate with lighting, blinds, HVAC, all of it. I'm going to move us along here. I'm going to go down a different path for a few minutes. And Vanessa, I wanted to bring up the topic of device certifications. So if you're going to develop something that is recommended for a Zoom room, a Microsoft Teams room, why would you be worried about making sure that some of your hardware is certified for those platforms? That's a great question. And certification certainly, I think, touch everybody here. Um, so certifications, I think, provide really that peace of mind for the end user, the individual that is responsible for that equipment, you know, once Varex walks out, right? Once Varex is done with the system integration. Um, so they are basically designed or they're tested, they're supported um, with those platforms. So they will work together, right? You don't have to worry about, you know, if this update comes to your, your team's room, um, you know, oh my gosh, my sure microphone isn't working. You know, that, that certainly would not happen with a device that is certified. So it's this interoperability, this compatibility, um, really this ease of mind. You can feel assured that the technologies are working together. The manufacturers are working together. They are kind of in lockstep in terms of updates and whatnot, so that there is no, you know, issue at all within that particular space. And I think, um, you know, it also simplifies things, right? So choosing your audio or camera device, it also can um, simplify that as well. Um, so you know kind of what you're, what you're using in that particular space. It's certified, um, you know, and, and you don't have any concerns going forward, so. And Carl, I know you're, a lot of your devices are certified for these platforms as well. Is there anything else you'd add to that? Oh, it's like from a manufacturer standpoint, it's like getting a free QA check on it. I mean, it's like the third party you can send it to, to be like, is my camera good enough? You know, does our optics meet the the uh, the test of the third party testing? Because they do some heavy testing in a really cool lab. I mean, if you look at the report on everything that comes out from the certification on the first go around, and this is from all the major manufacturers out there that have a certification program. Uh, they put things in, um, you know, chart testing environments. They have, you know, the lights going on in different areas. I know they have the, what's it called, the Anacoa chamber for a lot of the audio things. I mean, it is a, a, a really decent test and they test out all the different uh, intricacies from a technology standpoint. But then usually the manufacturer will do a subjective test. And that's when they actually take the camera, look at it with human eyes, 
And some of them even go far as they dog food it themselves. They put it in their own conference rooms, have their own guys run it for a while just to make sure everything's good. So through all those steps and phases, you know, you finally find out that your product's good, that it meets those standards. And for us, you know, I have it within our, um, uh, well, every time I write a MRD, uh, market research documentation, pretty much the document that says, this is everything that should be within the camera for this user, for that user, because they want to do this or that. Um, I always put on there, it has to be team certified because people have a great feeling and have confidence when they use a camera that is certified. They just, they are more inclined to use it. So. And it's really great for you guys as manufacturers because now the rest of us have a starting place. What hardware are we going to use? Oh, well, let's start with the certified list because there's going to be something on there that meets my needs. Oh, yeah. I want to move over to scalability. And Jeff, maybe we can give this one to you. We can wrap this around the idea of a Crestron Flex kit that's going to be a Zoom room or a Teams room using these other peripherals from Sure and Aver. How, how flexible are we in terms of that scalability from the smallest to something larger? Um, very scalable. So, um, and what just a point about about the uh, about being certified, um, it it lets you know across the board that you're working and meshing. Vanessa, you said it like we're we're working together to support, and and we've met the qualifications as Carl said of a Teams or a Zoom or whatever that company is that platform. So it's supportable. It's supportable from cradle to grave across the board. If my hardware, um, which includes an Aver camera and Sure mics, if there if we're all certified, then we can be really well supported, um, and and we can then partner with Microsoft or Zoom and find whatever the solution needs to be for an end user. Um, for scalability, I mean, I, I think that very few people had any kind of home office equipment and uh, it was usually just grab your laptop and pop into a room and do a meeting. And now with being shipped home and having to work in all of these different spaces, you know, having the right solution for the right expectations to hopefully deliver the right outcome. I mean, that's what it's all about. So if you have if you have a full on boardroom solution and you're trying to set that up in your living room and you don't have ports on your little POE switch, um, that's that's being set up for failure. So having the right solution that has the right audio balance, the right camera technology, I think is really critical, you know, not making the most of your budget. So you know, if all you need is a companion phone device that you offload some of your calling to, great, then get those and deploy those. If you do need a big boardroom where you need to have, you know, really robust audio and video and you're leaning on shore mics instead of a, a pre-built kit that we supply, great. Um, we're actually just launching into a partnership with Shure, so we're going to incorporate some of their core technology into our solutions, which will minimize the number of times you need to go and get a DSP or something. We'll have some of that sauce, that secret sauce built in so that there's a nice marriage between our UC kits and their microphone technology. Um, but you know, being able to reach into your portfolio and find the right solution that's at the right price point and has the right feature set, I think it's critical. Everyone feels better if they have the right thing for the right space. One of the really neat things to me that some people may not realize is that you can take a very complex space and ultimately boil it down to one USB cable. And if you want to, you could walk in there with your laptop, plug in your laptop, and now you have everything and anything <laughs> in the biggest boardroom. I don't know why you would do this, but you could scale that to say a stadium if it all comes back because anything can be converted to USB. And, and that connector is kind of where we are as an industry. So yes, okay, there's HDMI and that's gonna be your video. And so yes, we're probably gonna move into more USB-C presentation for connectivity for the user device. Um, but it's really boiling down to these Teams rooms, Zoom rooms, everything comes down to USB. Um, going off a little of a tangent here, um, Carl, is there any USB concerns that you've had with products and seeing people going down a bad path? Um, 
that's a very interesting question because I mean it's it's true what you said as far as um, you know using USB very powerful in the sense that you could pretty much use that connector for a lot of different things uh, but there's a distance limitation you know with with USB you know being able to go 200 feet 300 feet now you can you could use USB fiber um, connectors or extenders um, you know they cost a pretty penny uh, and they work great. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, going from um, or using um, uh, virtualized uh, connectivity like NDI or, or Dante and stuff like that has been kind of popular or lately uh, been pretty popular as well. So um, and then, you know, uh, like for us with some of our cameras, we do and we're playing around now with a virtual USB option. Um, which is pretty much emulating that uh, that same scenario for um, for what uh, NDI does. So it's a I see the market and early adoption for engineering going that route um, as far as virtualizing USB and getting it over Ethernet somehow. Um, but when you look at the power of USB and the simplicity of it, I mean, like you said, you could and being dynamic, you could or I could grab this Cam 130, but it has a light built in it with the USB. I could plug it into my laptop. I could throw it in my backpack, go into a large conference room and plug it in and use it from there. I mean, you'll be able to do that with a Pentel Zoom camera or anything else. So you wouldn't be able to do that with Ethernet <laughs> and setting up the virtualization for that. So um, so it's, it's uh, I mean, I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent in a lot of different areas with it, but just brainstorming off of that one question and figuring out, okay, where's the market going to go with USB? Um, it's uh, it's it's not going to go away. I could tell you that. It's definitely going to be here to stay. One thing you said that's exciting to me to think about and maybe talk about in a separate conversation is the concept of NDI or something similar with a virtualized USB because that eliminates a lot of boundaries. Because oh, what yeah. I don't like is having to figure out where to hide that USB transmitter box. Yep. <laughs> at my camera. I was like, is it going above the ceiling? I'm not going to zip tie it to the bottom of the camera plate. That'd be ridiculous. There's, there's a lot of nuance here that we need to figure out along the way. Oh, yeah. um, any other comments, either Jeff or Vanessa, about USB? Anything you guys are thinking about or, or roadmap products that might change the way we, we do USB? I mean, I, I think for where we are right now, USB has become such a, a, a welcome standard. So instead of organizations all having uh, um, proprietary cabling and, and connections, now the playing field is a little bit more level. And I think that that encourages cross collaboration. So just the ability for us to have easier partnerships or for our integrators to deploy projects that uh, can rely on USB. You know, it's like a normalizer. It's a, it levels the playing field a little bit so we can incorporate different technologies and really select best in breed and build it into your room solution. That sounds good. I think I'd like to bring Bill back here into the group with us to see if there's any questions that have come in that we could answer. Because sometimes Q&A is the most fun part of the conversation. <laughs> I agree. Um, we, we actually just had a couple questions pop in specific to the USB discussion that the, the four of you just started. Um, first question is, can you discuss USB 3.0 switching more? I am using this Xtron for routing to PC and laptop connections. The same with USB-C. Only a few decent solutions out now. And then there was a, a second follow-up question that was looking for better or more options for USB 3.0 plus routing as some of the KVM solutions out there are not completely compliant. I'm happy to take this one unless one of you guys want to jump in before me. I'll go for it. Um, so we've tested and deployed a variety of different solutions. The first time the request and the need came up for the USB 3 switching was two years ago now when we were first using Crestron Flex Kits and we needed to, the client had a unique use case, but we had to take the Hudley IQ, which yes, it can transmit video over USB 2.0, but it requires too much power. So that's where we went down this path. And at that point in time, we initially used a USB 3 switch from the company called A10, four hosts, four peripherals, Limitation is it required 422 or 485 for control. And sorry if you don't know what that means, but it means that we have to buy certain Crestron products because not every COM port for is made is created equal. Um, next along this path, there's more products that have been coming out. The next one that I've 
been excited about from Inno Genie, which is a simple switch called the toggle that does two ports, three peripherals, and that 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 works well. It has um, regular relay control or RS-232, which is nice because that means I can use any COM port from a control processor. Um, when it comes to Extron, they have a new USB switching lineup that it'll support 3.0 coming out in August that I think will be useful because it has that host and peripheral emulation. So if you look back at the A10, that's a really simple switch. So if you switch away from your Microsoft Teams room, the Teams room says, oh no, I lost all my peripherals, there's something wrong. If you have host emulation, you could be keeping that call live, but there's also nuance here. And I, I know I'm going way too far in the deep end here. Um, it's a conversation that I'd be happy to continue offline as well. Um, but there's a lot of things we have to do to manage that. So, you know, like one way to do it is you can buy from Crestron the Teams room with BYOD built in so that it manages it for us. So that the moment you plug in your laptop, it switches everything to your laptop seamlessly. Um, if for some reason you can't go down that path, we can add one of these external USB three switchers into the mix. Anybody else want to add anything? Ben, you, I think you covered everything right there. <laughs> oh, okay. One more. If you had to have USB C, there are more products coming out. If you look at the average AV product that's out there today that has a USB C connector on it, that's going to give you video and audio. If you need to have more of those other features, there are products coming out. Great, thank you. I only have a couple other questions. Um, does, does a Microsoft Teams room have camera control? Can it be added? Well, Microsoft know. Teams room, I know when you, like for instance, when you order the, um, the Crestron Flex kit, it, that does have control with it. Um, I know there's not control like on the desktop. Uh, and I know that in certain scenarios, uh, control was kind of missing or lacking is in, in other words, um, if whoever had the control uh, panel didn't have it in play, you were having a hard time. Uh, I think Microsoft has been adding control more often now. And I think it's one of those roadmap items that might be coming down as far as adding control within the desktop. So not specifically just for the room, but for a desktop as well. So in the in the Crestron UC kits, um, you can add a, a really a tiny little program, no processor, nothing else required. It just rides on the UC engine and it does camera control. So you can do pan, zoom, tilt. You can also create presets. So that's a really easy way to bring in camera control and camera customization. And then if you wanted to go further, then you would build in custom programming and work with Varex to you know, create some profiles and then you'd get into the other control as well. So not just camera, but HVAC and lighting blinds like that. So depending on what manufacturer, if you stick with Crestone, we have this whole world in front of us in hey. the sense of you can have your team's room and then flip out to a custom side. But you have to be careful with that as well because you don't want to complicate things. It's all about simplifying the experience. So we have to carefully work together to plan what the room is going to do. You don't want every bell and whistle and have 50 buttons on a touch panel. Bad idea. Absolutely. I remember those days when uh, programmers emulated the remote control with every single button. Oh my gosh. Um, last question, since we're coming up on the top of the hour. This is one I actually, I get myself a lot. Um, we've been seeing some delays on our projects. Do you have any supply issues? How are you handling back orders? So, we should, we should probably, yeah, go yeah, around, around Robin. You want to start, Jeff? Yeah, I'll take that first. Um, so, um, we, uh, you know, we're all suffering through this global chip shortage, um, which is impacting everything from cars to refrigerators and dishwashers and technology. You know, we're heavily reliant on technology. Um, we have a very tight relationship with one of our suppliers. And so they've guaranteed to keep our, our chip inventory coming at the levels we've seen. Um, I think all of us can agree there's a perfect storm happening, and that is um, businesses are coming back and they are ordering more and there's new projects and new strategies. So we have a shortage of raw materials and we have a, a onslaught of new projects. Um, what we're trying to do is to prioritize projects as they come in and, and stay in close 
contact with our customers and really accurately and transparently set their expectations. So you may get something in three weeks, you may get something in seven weeks, um, but we want to let everyone know so that they can plan their on-site staff. You want to go, Vanessa? Or? <laughs> I, I, it doesn't matter. I, I no, guess I'll I, go. I, I was going to say, because it's um, same story for me, really. I could just yeah. say ditto. <laughs> yeah, similar here too. I mean, we're we're all um, working through it. It is a perfect storm, as as Jeff mentioned. I think, you know, as much information as we can get on potential projects is what we're trying to really um, get a hold of. So, if there's something that you guys are aware of that you're working on, reach out to Verex, reach out to us, um, and we'll work together to do the best we can to meet the delivery needs. But um, please do understand, it is a global shortage. It is affecting so many technology devices. I was trying to buy a new car and that was virtually impossible. Um, the inventory is so small. Um, so just, just keep in mind, we are aware of it and we will work closely with you to um, ensure that we do the best we can to meet your needs. Cool. All right, one, one other question that just came in. Can you talk a little bit about security in terms of automated firmware and how it affects connected devices? I, I could um, I could touch up on that. I mean, because that was one of the big topic items uh, for our cameras that came up with Microsoft, um, and actually partnering with uh, with Crestron's engineering team as well. It was one of the big demands that and biggest concerns for uh, vendors out there, um, because you know when you look at it from a year ago, you know there was a lot of security concerns with a lot of different companies out there, um, and so they are. And when I say they, I was going to say our technology partners are taking a very cautious approach towards it, a very conservative approach to say, let's not, uh, um, you know, leave things open uh, for connectivity options for people to, um, you know, uh, take control of your device and or get data from your device with uh, without permission. So uh, through certification routes, and through checking with third-party vendors, um, that's how we have enabled most of our security protocols uh, for our cameras. And with that, a lot of the updates have been automated. So, you know, being able to use like Windows Update Services to update the firmware of our cameras is kind of enabled by now. Um, you know, when you first log into it, there's security measures on it to ensure that, um, to uh, to ensure that passwords are going to be changed, that is the right person being authenticated to it. So, high priority for us. Great. All right, we're coming up on the top of the hour. I want to thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, Carl, and thank you, Jeff. And then always, always a special thank you to you, Ben. Really appreciate everyone's time and insight. I also want to thank everyone for joining us today, and we hope you found this second in our three-part hybrid workplace webinar series valuable. Our next webinar in the series will be focused on the voice of the business, and we'll be excited to hear from our clients and their personal experience with Microsoft Teams, WebEx, and Zoom. The recorded replay will be available next week, and we'll share that recording with all the attendees. This and all our previous webinars are available for viewing on our Verix YouTube channel. If you have any questions or would like to schedule a personal discussion with anyone, please feel free to connect with any of us on LinkedIn. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a great day. Please stay healthy and take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.